We read in the ancient drama of Job. The Lord spoke to Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out of my womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. In these human words, God's voice is heard. The prophet Jeremiah wrote, Ebed Malek the Ethiopian, a eunuch in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. So Ebed Malek took some men with him and went to the house of the king to a wardrobe of the storehouse and took from there old rags and worn out clothes, which he let down to Jeremiah and the cistern by ropes. Then he bent Malak the Ethiopian and said to Jeremiah, just put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. Then they drew Jeremiah up by the ropes and pulled him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the garden. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, you made us in your image. You have given us gifts that we are meant to share. You love us, and you bless the love that we give and receive. We are forever yours, and so it is that we rejoice. Amen.
join me in the spirit of prayer. Let us dwell together in peace. And let us not be instruments of our own or others' of oppression. And now, may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Amen. We're going to talk about today three, uh, three pieces of scripture, three, three bits of scripture. And you've already heard two of them. Uh, the first, of course, from uh, Job, the second of Jeremiah, and then I have another one coming. And so we have a parable, and a prophet, and finally a prayer. So first we'll look at the parable, the story of Job. Job is an ancient drama. It's the oldest book in our Bible, and it's even older than that because it was, a, it was borrowed from another culture. From, uh, so it was going around even before it was adapted to suit the needs of our ancestors. So it's a very, very old story. And uh, it, it's one that's, you don't need to take literally, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it can't be, actually. I mean, it opens with a, a, this bizarre sort of uh, contest between God and one of the members of God's court, Hasatan, the Satan, the accuser. And um, so this accuser just, just challenges God one day, and, and God falls for it. The accuser says, you know, you have this guy, Job, who really is into you, but why wouldn't he be? You know, his life is great. I bet he wouldn't be so faithful if his life was more difficult. And God said, you're on. And so suddenly they start playing with, the, with, with, with Job's life. Actually, the accuser sets him up. And in the most terrific ways, his, his children die. He loses all of his money. His health is compromised. His wife has a nervous breakdown. Uh, it, and then his friends who come to comfort him actually blame him for all of his misery. They don't turn out to be very good friends at all. And when Job just doesn't know what else to do, he just can't take it anymore, then he has this confrontation with God. God shows up in a whirlwind, and they have a big quarrel. And, uh, and that's where we heard that reading today, where God basically asks Job, who are you? Who do you think you are? Where, where have you been? What do you know? And so God basically gives God's resume about all the things God has done that, that uh that Job can't comprehend, wasn't around for, including the spectacular act of giving birth to creation. And when God's water breaks, that's the seeds, the story says. You know, whose womb uh, flowed, uh, from whose womb flowed out the seed? Well, of course, it's God's womb, not Job's womb. And uh, so there we have it, a, a, at least one reference in scripture where we actually, where God's genitalia is named. <laughs> and not the boy parts. <laughs> the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. So, <laughs> it's all allegory, it's all myth, it's all any other metaphor, but it's important because we tend to privilege the male stuff and overlook this other stuff, which is also there, right? And so, um, and so if we're going to have a liberating approach to scripture, we have to notice all the ways that people are liberated. And so, you know, God, the birthing mother of creation, has a pretty liberative image. Well, what I love about this story, though, isn't the God, that, that Job is fussing at God, and God is fussing back, and the God shows up as, as a tornado, and the God talks about birthing the world and whatnot. What I love about it is the question, who are you? Just who do you think you are? And the answer you don't get until the very end. The answer is, Job is a survivor. Job has lost everything. Job has lost his money. Job has lost his family. Job has lost his health. Job has lost his friends. And Job has even been cursed out by God. And he survives it all. Survives it all. Is still standing at the end. And in fact, not only has he ridden out all the difficult days, but he has, st he has stayed strong until good days return. Sometimes we in the faith business, we sometimes feel like, what have I done wrong if, if, if my health didn't bounce right back? Or if, I, if I, the job isn't what I thought it would be. Or if I can't seem to make the, the ends meet. If we think we're going through a difficult time, that we must have done something wrong. Job did nothing wrong, and he went through a difficult time. But he got through it, and in the fullness of time, saw better days. What Job is, who do you think you are? Well, if you get to the end of the story, the answer is clear. I'm a survivor. so are we. We've been through some stuff, we've seen some stuff, and we're still here. 
we are survivors. The other story, that, that story from the prophet Jeremiah, where we see a Bedmelech, a eunuch, and uh, that's the star of this bit of the story, Jeremiah 38. It's all about Abedmelech. Abedmelech is the star. And for maybe the first time in Abedmelech's life, he gets to be a star. Because he is a eunuch from Ethiopia. Eunuchs were usually slaves. And so we're seeing an enslaved person. And a eunuch, someone who has been physically, uh, he, he's, he's had his own physical trials and tribulations, you know what I mean. And so this is a person who's been afforded the dignities and rights of the elite. Eunuchs were also often sexualized. They were, they, they were preyed upon. They were identified and judged by what had happened to their genitalia. They were eroticized and sexually exploited, forced to do all kinds of things because they were slaves, and because they were odd, and so they could be fetishized. Abimelech has had his body altered, almost certainly without his consent. He, though perhaps privileged within the slave class, is a slave nevertheless. And he may have been sexually exploited simply because of who he is. It is just not hard at all to make a queer connection to Abimelech. But wait, there's more. He may actually, by nature and orientation, be gay. There are some hints that other gay men might pick up on instantly. Because here comes Jeremiah to uh, 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 Abimelech to Jeremiah's rescue. Some people who don't like Jeremiah, prophets always have their critics. Uh, not all of them get thrown into holes, but Jeremiah did. So he has been tossed into this muddy pit, to the cistern, to this deep well, and left to starve and die. And Abimelech finds out about it and comes to the rescue. Now, a lot of people, maybe even most of us, would have grabbed the rope, gone to the hole, tossed the the the, the, uh, the uh, broke down, asked three or four of our strongest women friends to pull it up, and, <laughs> and called it a day, right? Not Abedmelech. Abedmelech, before he even gets the rope to toss it down there, first makes Jeremiah some armpit cushions so that the rope won't chafe his arm. Hello, he's making armpit cushions. <laughs> I know you're hungry, I know you're, you're, you're wet and, and feeling gross, but give me a minute, because I, I can crank out some of these armpit cushions, and I'll make it so much more comfortable for you. Isn't it Ben Lip, the hostess with the mostest? Don't, don't you see who she is, right? Armpit cushions, ladies and gentlemen. If he ain't, I ain't. That's what I'm saying. And it's even more than that. He doesn't run and grab the first thing. He doesn't run into the linen cupboard and get the fine linen to make it. No, he's not going to ruin the good linen. He's not a savage. So he says, get some old clothes and rags. And so he doesn't, he doesn't use the good stuff, but he also doesn't want poor old Jeremiah to chafe. And so Jeremiah's comfort and that household's dignity are all preserved, all in the act of making armpit cushions from old stuff, thus making Edmemelech a contender to be the next cast member on Queer Eye for the Straight Man. <laughs> a eunuch, a gay man, a fussy gay man, a slave, someone clearly in the margins of society, but who is a Bedlam really? He's a hero. The prophet doesn't save the Bedlam, a Bedlam saves the prophets. The slave, the eunuch, the fussy gay guy is the savior of the story, just like the mighty warriors of Stonewall, whose flying false eyelashes and projectile new press-on nails were the rocket's red glare for the LGBTQ community. <laughs> just as those self-described butch dykes and drag queens, some of whom would now be identified as transgender, stood up, they stood up, to injustice and oppression and repel the police with not only makeshift weapons but also with kick lines and campy chants. The queers of Christopher Street were our heroes. They birthed a movement and a dream for a safer, more inclusive world. The units of our own time were the heroes, just as Evendelec was a hero, just as we who continue the work today are heroes. And finally, a prayer. We haven't heard this one yet. It's the 10th Psalm. 
This was written well over a thousand years ago. It might have been written this week. And so let me read to you the tenth psalm. Why, Lord? Why do you stand at a distance and pay no heed to these troubled times? Arrogant scoundrels pursue the poor. They trap them by their cunning schemes. The wicked even boast of their greed. These robbers curse and scorn the Lord. In their insolence, the wicked boast. God doesn't care. God doesn't even exist. Yet their affairs always seem to succeed. They ignore your judgment on high. They sneer at all who oppose them. They say in their hearts, we will never fall. Never will we see misfortune. Their mouths are full of violence and lies. Discord and evil are under their tongues. They wait in ambush near borders. Their eyes watch for the helpless to murder the innocent in secret. They lurk in ambush like lions in a thicket, hide there to trap the poor, snare them and close the net. The helpless are crushed, laid low. They fall into the power of the wicked, who say in their hearts, God pays no attention, shows no concern, never even bothers to look. Rise up, Lord God. Raise your arm. Do not forget the poor. Why should the wicked scorn God, say in their hearts, God doesn't care? But you do see. You do observe this misery. You do see this sorrow. You take the matter in hand. To you, the helpless can entrust their cause. The Lord reigns forever. You listen, Lord, to the needs of the poor. You encourage them and hear their prayers. You win justice for the orphan and oppressed. And the day will come when no one on earth will cause terror again. The psalmist looking at oppression. And it's always something, isn't it? It's always the same community, but it's always the same soul sickness of trying to tear down or exclude or vilify or demonize or dehumanize someone. It could be the Muslims. It could be the Jewish community, it could be transgender people, it could be same gender loving people, it could be Sikhs worshiping in their temple in the Midwest. It could be anything. It could be families trying to escape hell on earth only to find, guess what, it can get worse. It can be anything, but it's the same oppressive sickness, the same desire to control, to oppress, to rule over, to to, to exploit. And the psalmist doesn't know what to do about it. He's so tired of the pain he sees for his community and others. What's he going to do? And so what he does is what people of faith do. He prays. But he didn't pray pretty prayer. He prayed the kind of prayer that Job prayed, shaking his fist at God. God, how long? How long is this going to go on? Do you even see any of this? Why am I upset? You don't seem to be bothered. But that's where it starts. These songs, they start with the raw emotion and pray their way through a healthier perspective. Why? Why, God, aren't you doing more? Why, God, aren't you paying attention? Why? Oh, wait. Now that I've gotten that out of my system, that's right. The Lord reigns forever. And the day will come when injustice and oppression cease. I love the songs because they take our arms they, and they just give voice to it to get it out of us so that God can, once that is out of the way, God can speak to us and say, there's a better day coming and we can do this together. So who is the psalmist as the psalmist prays first his anxiety and then his hope and then his assurance? Who is the psalmist praying that prayer? The psalmist is God's partner in the work for justice. The psalmist prays until he re-embraces the vision of God's kingdom and recommits to it. The psalmist is God's partner in the work for justice. And so are we. So LGBTQ plus means everybody. 
justice workers, children of God, you are a survivor. That's who you are. You are a hero. That's who you are. You are God's partner. That's who you are. Or as we say here at Sunshine Cathedral, you are God's miracle and not God's mistake. This is Pride Sunday, and this is the good news. Amen. Recognizing the interdependence of all life, we strive to build loving community. If you are older, and I am younger, if you will not divide us. If you are cisgender, and I am transgender, it will not divide us. If you are heterosexual and I am a same gender loving person, it will not divide us. If you were born in this country and I was not, it will not divide us. If you are a person of color and I am white, it will not divide us. If your body is strong and mine is in pain, it will not divide us. If you pray with these and I do not, if you invoke the saints or ancestors and I do not, if you lift your hands while I bow my head, Pray in tongues while I sit in sacred silence. If you revere texts that are unknown to me, these things will not divide us. We are becoming more aware of our union with God and with all people. And so it is. Yeah. 